Hello there. This is the story of Ed and Lorraine Warren and their most haunting investigations. Stay tuned to find out about five of the craziest paranormal incidents taken care of by this unique couple. Edward and Lorraine Warren, one of the most recognizable ghostbusters and paranormal investigators in the U.S. history. While Lorraine professed to be clairvoyant, Ed was mostly a self-taught demonologist and an author. The main reason that led to their wedding in 1945 was their similar interests about paranormal activity. Now let's take a look at some paranormal incidents where this couple was involved. Let's start off with the Sneketer House incident. Alan and Carmen moved into their new home, a house located in Southington CT with their three sons, a daughter, and two nieces. This house had once been a funeral home. They had a neighbor who lived upstairs. In the basement, the family found some mortuary equipment which included a coffin hoisting apparatus, toe tags, a medical gurney, and blood drains. Having these things in their new home made the family very uncomfortable. They had not been in the house for too long when they started experiencing all sorts of evil. This included apparitions. The oldest son, who was undergoing Hodgkin's disease, was going through abrupt, violent changes in his personality. Ed and Lorraine were soon called to investigate this house, and they officially proclaimed the house possessed. Let's hear from Lorraine Warren herself about this incident. Hi, I'm here with uh, Lorraine Warren, and we have a few minutes just to talk about, um, just to kind of talk about the truth behind what really happened in the Southington um, haunting uh, on Meriden Road. Um, Meriden Avenue. On Meriden Avenue. Um, now, what, on your perspective, I know the, the movie was loosely based on it. Very. Um, what happened inside of that house um, that you can recall? Okay. Uh, let me say this. We, we, um, we entered the home the morning after we were contacted by Carmen Snedeker mm -hmm. and her niece, who was living with the family at that time. And um, we didn't know too much about it other than the fact that, you know, when she called, she was hysterical on the telephone. When we got there, it went right downstairs into mm -hmm. the basement area. And I talked to her and her niece for a while. I don't think the husband had moved from New York State to Connecticut at that time. Mm -hmm. He had to transfer with his job. You see, um, the son was getting chemo at UConn Medical, and they were actually going back and forth I think more than once a week for that, for him. And that was taking its toll. So that's how they happened to come about renting this home that they rented. Mm -hmm. uh, when Ed and I got into the house itself, we separated and Ed went downstairs. After a little while, I went downstairs. And as soon as I walked into the first room, um, it was just an overwhelming bad feeling. I, I, I had a feeling of fear and like that, mm -hmm. that I probably was picking up from the boy who had experienced what he had in that room, which was his bedroom. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that that room was a coffin room where the coffins were kept, where they would pick out the, for the, um, the, the families would pick out the coffin. Mm -hmm. And um, then I started to walk down the hallway. I'm not seeing Ed, mm -hmm. and I knew he hadn't passed me, so I couldn't quite understand where he went. Now, as I walked down the hall, there was little anti-rooms, kind of, that went off where there were things, different things stored. I got down to the end of the hallway, and I looked to my left, and I could see the area where they brought the, the bodies in, mm -hmm. and it was the double doors on that side of the driveway. Then there was two prep rooms, and one of them was a bloodletting area, and the other was where they would bring the bodies up for viewing. And I thought, oh my God, why would these trappings still be here? for a family coming here with a young family. And it was kind of uncomfortable, but I thought, well, they're not buying the house. You know, they're just really renting here. And so I didn't say anything about that. I didn't address that part of the issue. But while I was in this area where they prepped the bodies, I had horrible bad feelings. And why should I have such horrible bad feelings when it's it was people who had passed and it was people who were being prepared for burial. And but a far a four more had exactly, I believe, had gone on in that area that the family was not aware of. For one thing, Carmen was not aware that she actually rented a funeral home. She was not aware of that when she did that. So then we went upstairs and she began talking, and the niece began talking about the frightening things that were happening in the home. The one frightening thing that was happening in the home is that where the niece slept, which was on that the main floor of the house in a small bedroom, the covers on her bed would levitate off her 
they would levitate right off her, and then you would see something under the covers besides her. And that's really, you know, that would terrify this niece that was sleeping, that was living there with them. So this went on for a period of time. We asked the Catholic priest if he was the parish priest, if he would come and bless the house. And he did. He did come to bless the house, but it needed far more than a blessing of the house mm -hmm. because it just seemed to antagonize what was there. You could stay like the whole night as we would do in the home itself. When we were there, we would stay in the master bedroom. <coughs> Not that we were sleeping, mm -hmm. but we were there. And you would hear that chain voice coming up mm -hmm. by itself. So Ed went down there to see if there was anybody doing that. <coughs> Excuse me, moving that chain, chain hoist like that. Mm -hmm. There was no one. There was no one down there at all. He could actually see that actually happening at that time. Then there was these two people of science, and they asked Ed if it would be possible for them to go into the house mm -hmm. and spend the night with us there in the home and see exactly what they, as people of science, would be able to pick up. They fled in the middle of the night. Did they say, ever say what they seen here? They never, they never ever contacted us again. They left in the middle of the night. They actually moved from the school that they were teaching in in Connecticut. They moved to some place we were told in New York State oh, wow. to teach. So they were frightened. They were intimidated by what was there. Then we decided it would be best um, to talk to the bishop to find out what we could do. The bishop assigned two uh -huh. priests to come. One of the priests was an exorcist. The other was a very high-ranking clergyman, Catholic priest. And they both came there and said masses. They both wrote letters to the bishop mm -hmm. that the house required an exorcism, but they didn't want to be the priest, to be picked to be the exorcist. Oh. And so the bishop assigned another priest mm -hmm. as an exorcist, and the house was successfully exorcised. And I want the people who own that home today, which I told them that it was successfully exorcised, mm -hmm. I want them to really, truly know that, because they shouldn't be experiencing anything in that house except the intrusion of the public, which I feel very, very bad for them yeah. regarding that. I feel horrible for that family. And um, so it was successfully exercised. After it was successfully exercised, mm -hmm. there was a big tree out in front of the house. And it was strange. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a stormy night. It wasn't a rainy night. It wasn't a windy night. And what happened was that a large branch fell from a big tree. There's no big tree there now. I see they have two young trees in front of the house. Mm -hmm. And it was this one big tree that fell and it um, knocked out electricity in a large area of Southington. And that was right after the exercise, like, after yes, the, exercise the house? And there was a town meeting that night mm -hmm. and they weren't able to do anything because of it. They, mm -hmm. they, 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 weren't able, they weren't able to do anything at all because of that. They weren't able to hold it. So, yeah, so that basically is kind of, you know, to give you an overview, you know, otherwise I could be here for two hours telling you everything that, that, that actually happened and took place in the house. But that's basically what happened. There were masses said, and there was an exorcism said, there was, there was a blessing done, there was everything done in stages where the Catholic Church was concerned for their welfare. So, thank you very much. Let's not forget to mention that the upper neighbor was living without any trouble. After they left the house, the subsequent owners had never reported any kind of supernatural activity. In the winter of 1970, Roger Perrone purchased a 200-acre property located in the small country town of Harrisville, Rhode Island. He moved in with his wife, Carolyn, and five daughters, Christine, Andrea, Nancy, Cynthia, and April. The family began experiencing strange things happening almost right after they moved in. It started small, like a broom moving place to place and dirt found on the newly cleaned kitchen floor. The girls began to notice spirits wandering around the house. After some research, Carolyn found out the, the house had been in the same family for over eight generations. She also learned that some family members had died under mysterious circumstances. Out of all the spirits, the worst one was Bathsheba. It turned out that it was a real person named Bathsheba Sherman who lived in this property in the mid-1800s. There was a rumor about her that she was a Satanist. The Peron family believed that it was her spirit that was causing them trouble. Ed and Lorraine visited their house multiple times during the 10 years they spent in terror. On their last visit, Roger kicked the Warrens out of the house, 
worried about his wife's mental stability. Let's hear about this incident from Andrea Perón, who is one of the five daughters of the Perón family. That this was bigger, stronger, and more powerful than any of us had ever had a sense of. And none of us moved into that house thinking, oh, I wonder if it's haunted. We were little kids. We, that, that concept never occurred to us. My parents are both Virgos, very sensible, very pragmatic, very intelligent, very scientifically based people, both of them. And it took a while for my father to accept the fact that the house was haunted. But meanwhile, my mother was going through incredible turmoil and my sisters were having experiences of their own. I was having experiences of my own. We could see that my mother was troubled by something. And so we did not impose what was happening with us, the five girls, on her. Instead, my sisters would come crawl into bed with me at night, sometimes crying, sometimes trembling, and would cuddle up to me and say, Annie, Annie, there are voices in my room and something's moving my bed. There are voices and they all talk at once and they all say the same thing. And that's my little sister, Cindy, eight years old. There are seven dead soldiers buried in your wall over and over, almost like a chant. One voice, but several, seven. And she would crawl up in bed with me and cuddle up next to me and say, just keep me safe, keep me safe, I'm so afraid. And then she would come to me and say, Annie, there's a little girl that walks through my bedroom. She's tiny. She's maybe four or five years old. And she's crying for her mommy. And she looks just like you. She looks just like you. Well, Cindy didn't know what I looked like at four or five years old because she wasn't born yet. But she'd seen family photographs. And so she was describing this little girl and then we thought there were two of them because sometimes the little girl would appear in a, almost a flannel or a linen gray shift with a little white pinafore. And she looked very healthy and robust. And she'd often carry a book under her arm. And she'd walk through the bedroom. She'd come out of the eaves. She'd walk through the bedroom and she'd go into the closet with the chimney. And she wouldn't say anything. She would just pass through. But when she'd come other times, she was dressed she was emaciated, there was nothing left to her. And she was wearing a beautiful, beautiful green velvet full length dress. That was what she was buried in. And she's been there forever. And she's not the only one. Keep in mind, this house was on property that was deeded, was surveyed by the original John Smith that came to Providence, to um, the Plymouth Plantation um, at Plymouth Rock. and. He did the surveying and the deeding for Roger Williams for the state of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, which is the actual name of the state. And the reason that Roger Williams parsed, parceled out huge pieces of property was to retain the state that he had founded as a colony. It was not a state for many years to come, but Connecticut, the colony of Connecticut was trying to take their bite out of it and Massachusetts was trying to take their bite out of it. So he gave vast tracts of land out and this property was thousands of acres big originally. And the house as it stands right now was completed in 1736. So if you do the math, eight full generations of one extended family lived in that house and died in that house prior to our arrival and a number of them never left. My mother started doing the historical research. She always said, they're not just passing through. These people are somehow attached to this piece of property. And she began a very exhaustive, extensive research process, trying to determine who had lived in the house, how long they had lived in the house, when they died, where they died, and why they're still there. We found out that the man that was leaning up in the corner of the parlor, the dining room, when we moved in, uh, is very likely Johnny Arnold who crawled up into the eaves of my bedroom and drank horse liniment and killed himself and died an extremely excruciating death. And then there's little Prudence Arnold, who was raped murdered by a farmhand. She was 11 years old. She doesn't know she's dead. It goes on and on. I can name them all. It doesn't mean that I'm absolutely right. It doesn't mean that the history has it exactly right, but we did our best to try to identify these spirits, and my mother did it 
with her own purpose, and that was to identify them and then perhaps usher them on, do something to help them move on so that they were not eternally tethered to this property. Time does not exist for them. It's an irrelevant notion for us. It's just how we measure our time on this planet, and we made it up because we had to have some way of saying, you know, we're here for this, this, but for the spirits, they have absolutely no notion of time. And they're also tethered to that property, and I know that they are because about 20 years after we left, my sister Cindy and Nancy, two of my sisters, decided that they wanted to go up to the farm and they wanted to visit. And the woman who owns the farm now was very gracious and she allowed them to come in. And the first thing that happened is they got put, what Cindy always called being put in the bubble, where you can scream at the top of your lungs and a person that's 10 feet away won't hear you and won't know that you're in trouble and won't know that you're in distress. And they immediately got put in the bubble and felt hands on their faces and their hair being played with and they both without talking to each other felt it and the woman who owns the house now was talking to them and they couldn't hear her it was like uh, Charlie Brown's teacher wah, 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 wah. they couldn't even discern what she was saying because they were being spoken to directly by the spirit that was there to protect them from the evil presence in that house and they sensed both of them and she got right up in their faces and she said oh my god it's you you're back I took my father back there last year for the first time in 30 plus years that he had stepped foot on that property. He was immediately approached. I never walk into that house that something doesn't go flying, that something, a light just sparkles through the, the room. And it's their way of acknowledging us and recognizing us and telling us that they do. And so when I finished the books, it took three years to write all three books and I did it to the exclusion of all else, quite literally. My mother says I lived on catnaps and coffee for three years. But when I walked into that house, after it was done, I felt enveloped as though I was being steeped in drawn butter, a sense of love and acceptance that I had never, ever felt in that house before. And it's because they know I've told their story, they know I've told it well, and I've been honest, and I've treated them fairly. And that includes Bathsheba. Bathsheba Sherman was a very young woman when she lived in that house, and she was in charge of an infant. She was about 16 or 17 years old. Well, that baby died. And when the doctor examined the corpse, found that a needle had been impaled in the base of its skull and it had convulsed and died. Consequently, she was accused of murder. And because Burlville, the town, was not even incorporated then, she had to be, um, there was an inquest, and she was taken to Chepachet, Rhode Island. And she was let off the hook, a la Lizzie Borden. She talked her way out of it. There's no way to know if she did this thing or not, this horrible thing, if she did this or not. But it didn't even matter because she was tried in the port, court of public opinion and that woman lived her entire lifetime being called a harlot, being called a devil worshiper, being called a witch, that she had sold her soul to the devil for eternal youth and beauty. It is so much a part of the vernacular. It is so much a part of the, the folklore of that area of Rhode Island. Bathsheba Sherman was known far and wide and she had four children and they all died before the age of four years old. And she went from being a young, ravishing beauty to a shriveled, crippled horror of a woman who had a reputation for brutalizing her farmhands and her staff, who had a reputation for just being evil and bitter and vindictive. And her death certificate lists her death caused by paralysis. And the doctor who examined her said her body had literally turned to stone. She died in 1885. The family wasn't able to leave the house due to financial instability. They continued to live there until 1980 when they were finally able to move out. By this time, the spirits were silenced. This story has inspired the famous film The Conjuring. Peggy Hodgson was a single mother who lived with her four children in a house located in the Green Street in the North London suburb, Enfield. In the August of 1977, Police arrived at her house as she reported that her family heard strange knocking in their walls. One of the policemen witnessed an unimaginable scene of a chair that dragged itself right in front of him. For the next 18 months, stories of even crazier phenomenon were reported, which included furniture being thrown around the house and the voice of an old man talking through one of the sisters, Janet. The Society of Physical Research came to know about this haunted house and sent two of its members, 
Maurice Gross, and Guy Lyon Playfair to investigate the family. Eventually, events in the house just stopped, but not before Janet spent time in London's Maudsley Psychiatric Hospital. She is still clearly affected by happenings in the house. I know what I experienced. I know it was real, she says, in a new Apple TV Plus four-part drama documentary series about the phenomenon. It follows you. It has never left me. The Conjuring 2 film is based on this story. Let's check out an interview with the two possessed sisters. These teenage sisters believe they're haunted well, by a poltergeist. I was going to ask the same question as I asked earlier. How many voices are there? Six hundred. Six hundred the voices. I know the joke. How uh, many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had ten. Three. Um, sensible voices, but the rest of the names are absolute rubbish. Eleven-year-old Janet Hodgson appears to be the focus of many of the strange happenings in Green Street, but they also affect her 14-year-old sister Margaret and their younger brother Billy. One of the first manifestations was when Lego bricks began to fly at high speed around the living room. How does it feel to be haunted by a poltergeist? It's not haunted. Shh. Why isn't it haunted? I don't know. I'm does it frighten you, the things that happen here? Oh, well, it did first, but now I've got more How used to it. And you learn to accept the things that happen. It's slang like covered it, Mum. My idiot mum slung a bookshelf at mum. Yeah. Have you tried telling it to go away? Yes, many times. No, nothing. And what does it reply? Mm. No, it won't. It's staying another six, seven years. The local police could find no explanation for the knocking either. They were even more baffled when two of their beat constables reported seeing an armchair levitate across the Hodgson's living room. It um, came off the floor, or maybe a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet, before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't, it didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. Maurice Gross is an electronics engineer and an investigator for the Society for Psychical Research. Over here was Janet, and over here in this bed here was Margaret. It was in the same bedroom a month later with all the family present that Maurice Gross first challenged the poltergeist to talk. And this was actually the result. You'll hear here uh, the whistling first of all and then the barking. The barking here is quite extraordinary, actually. I then said to it, I then, uh, as I said on the tape here, I then said to it, if you can whistle and bark and groan, then you can talk. And I asked it to actually say my name. <laughs> I want you to call out my name, my complete name, Morris Gross. See if you can do that. Very good. 
Let me hear you say my name again. Come on, let me hear you say my name. Come on, my name is Morris. Let me hear you say it. Morris. Now that was the first time we heard the voice and since then we've been hearing it again and again and it's been getting louder and louder. What about the voices? When, when did the voices start? December the 12th. December the 12th? Yes. And how did this start? Well, one night Mr Grove was talking about it, about Eight thirty. He said, "All we need now is the voices to talk." And that night, I went to bed, and I can't remember exactly what happened. What, and what's that knocking? Yeah, that's you can hear it now. I was doing that yesterday morning, and Peggy was on her own, so she came into us because. And it wasn't her, she came come in. We sat together and we heard it. And I counted down my knocks and there was 14 all together. And it's doing it again now. So that was three knocks just now? Yes, it goes in threes and twos. Now we first got contacted, this was when Mr. Gross said, if there's anyone there, knock twice, but yes, and if not, one of them now. I wonder, if we did that now, whether it would answer. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? Nothing. No. Mm. It doesn't always do it to order. No. It, doesn't, it goes in spasms. Like we're talking now. It may not now, after you've said that, but you won't do it when you want it to straight away. No. What about the voices? They sometimes um, say things and make answers. Mm. Is that the voice now? Yeah. Is anybody there? How many voices are there? Dirty Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart Thurton. Dirty Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart Thurton. Oh, has he ever spelt that for you? No. Mr. Ghost asked him, but say it struck Mr. Ghost last night when he asked. Or sometime ago. And Sorry. what what do you think? these are? Are they people or are they just voices? Could be spirits, how are they? Ghosts, spirit, speaking for us somehow. No. We don't get this at school, these voices are. Because I'll be when we're all separate, it's not so strong. Just when you come near each other? Yeah, like here or our aunts, we will be together or in Peggy's at school. And Janet, your voice is stronger, isn't it? It seems to be the strongest. Yeah. Does, when you hear the voice and it comes out, where does it come from? Here, your throat? No. Where do you feel it comes Back from? Back of the neck. Back of the neck. And so it must be as if it's somebody else speaking there. When you hear yeah, it. behind us. And do you get the feeling when you hear the voice that there is a person there? Yes. Yeah. And do they tell you much about themselves? Not really, no. They just tend to growl and... and play around and sort of joke and be silly. I wonder, do you think there's anyone there just now? Yeah. I do. Who's that? What? Who's that, Janet? Pardon? Who? Stuart. Sir. 
Stuart Certain, and he's one of the voices. Yeah. Why do you think he comes and speaks through you? To noise, to a noise. Does he ever say anything nice? No. Yeah. Don't know, really. Shall we try and speak to him? No. We'll see if he'll speak to us. Yeah. Is anybody there? No, no. Who's there? Doctor A. Doctor Who? Chases here. Mr. Gross, a lot of people hearing these voices produced by the children will simply say that they are very good ventriloquists mm -hmm. and that this is all a hoax. Mm. How would you react to that? Certainly not. Um, they're, they're certainly not very good ventriloquists. We have had tests on them to see whether they can ventriloquize. They can't. Um, to keep up this particular type of voice, for any length of time without damage to the vocal cords is absolutely impossible. I mean, there must be some hoarseness attached to it. But don't forget, these children don't do this for a couple of minutes or so. They do it for lengths of periods up to three hours and without any hoarseness or sore throats whatsoever. Well, perhaps, Guy, perhaps you've got something to say to Yeah. I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Janet's vocal cords to pieces. If I do yeah. it for half a minute, I get a sore throat. Joe? Guy Lyon Playfair is an author of books on the paranormal with experience of poltergeist cases in Europe and Brazil. How do you do it, mate? God, they're cowards. Don't you ever get a sore throat, Janet? No. Sure? Yeah. You never get pain in the back of the neck or something? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, what do you mean? I, I don't ask for you. I'm not with you. What? I feel oh, you're with me now? Will you? Um, it's like in the back of my neck, yeah. Well, tell us about that. Oh, no, tell about me about, tell me about that. You get it, you get it now? It's buzzing in the, the back of your neck? Yeah. Do you feel it vibrating as if it was sort of, um... No, like someone... Someone what? Put their hands on the back of my neck like that. Poltergeists seem to thrive on an atmosphere of tension that is partly sexual. The fact that most of the focuses are adolescents seems to contribute to the mischievous nature of the effects, leading some to suggest that the kids are faking or enjoying a laugh at the expense of the investigators. But to create all the bizarre effects that went on in this house either involves a gigantic conspiracy with the neighbors or a disruption in our laws of mind and matter. In the movie, most of the investigation about this family's terror was done by the Warrens, though. In real life, they did do the investigation, except to a far lesser extent. Up next, we have the true story of Annabelle, which had inspired a series of movies. In all the Annabelle movies, Annabelle is basically a porcelain doll, which looks like she has a tone of makeup on her face. Though in real life, she is just an Ann doll and looks much ordinary. The Annabelle doll was gifted to Donna, a young nurse, on her 28th birthday by her mother. Donna shared it with another nurse, Angie, as they both lived in the same apartment. The doll was seemingly adorable, but before long, the two women began to notice that it moved around the apartment, place to place, by itself. Then, some time later, the women started finding notes all around the apartment. They claimed that the notes were written on parchment paper, which they didn't even have in their home. Strange things just continued happening in that apartment. Following their traumatic experiences, they invited a medium over to their apartment to help solve what seemed like a paranormal problem. The medium claimed that the doll was inhabited by the spirit of a deceased seven-year-old named Annabelle Higgins, whose body had been found years earlier on the site where their apartment building had been built. They also said that the spirit simply wanted to be loved and cared for. 
The women felt bad for the spirit and allowed her to live in the doll permanently. Donna and Angie eventually attempt to get rid of the Annabelle doll's spirit. This is where Ed and Lorraine Warren were alerted. They believed that the major problems the two women faced occurred when they started to give the doll their sympathy. They also believed that there was a demonic force within Annabelle in search of a human host and not a benevolent soul. They said that the spirit just manipulated the doll in order to get recognition and was actually looking to possess a human host. Now let's hear about this incident from Ed and Lorraine themselves. Out, but I know you've had thousands, thousands literally of cases. Oh God, yes. And I also know that you have a museum on your property. Yes. Now, Ed, would you want to just tell a little bit about some of the things perhaps that are in that museum that are really fascinating, scary things perhaps that you've collected over the years? All right, I think one of the most famous would be Annabelle. Mm -hmm. This is a Raggedy Ann doll that's made like thousands of other dolls, except that this doll was used in communication, almost like having a seance. Mm -hmm. A nurse had received the doll 1971 as a present, a Christmas present from her mother. And the doll stands about three foot high and she would take it to bed with her at night. That's common enough for girls to do. I take a pillow. Some people take a doll. Girls would like that. Even 28 year old ones. And after a few nights, she lived with another girl who was a nurse, both of them St. Hartford or um, St. Or Hartford Hospital. It was Hartford Hospital. Hartford Hospital. And, uh, mm -hmm. They were on the same shift and so they worked together, they lived together, they shared the expenses. And one morning she got this idea to bring the doll from the bedroom into the kitchen where they were having breakfast and she put it in a chair. And she said, oh, Raggedy Ann here's gonna have breakfast with us today, joking around. Okay, well that was a joke. Then the next thing, oh, bless me, bless you. the next thing, uh, she brought it down again the next morning and the next morning, but the third morning, they're talking to the doll and the arms of the doll are on the chair like this. Suddenly they went up and onto the table. Now this didn't frighten them, this intrigued them, to the extent that the one nurse said to the other one, one of the nurses knows a medium, let's ask her about this, I'll bet you there's a spirit in that doll, that's what they did. They asked this nurse about it, and she said, yeah, she said, uh, I know a woman who is a medium, I'll bring her over, and we'll hold the seance. It was a joke, just a, a game, but it didn't turn out to be a game, it turned out to be one of the most horrifying experiences they'd ever have in their life. <laughs> and I've talked with people just recently, as recent as two months ago, who know the two nurses, and even today, they don't like to talk about it. They'll never come to our lectures. <laughs> they don't want to talk about Raggedy Ann, Annabelle at all. So now the, the woman holds a seance and she said, there's a spirit of a six-year-old girl in that doll who was killed in an automobile accident just outside of your apartment house here. Hmm. Well, there was a six-year-old child by the name of Annabelle who was killed, but God does not allow the spirit of a child to go into a doll. This was a demon who was posing as that little child to create sympathy to these two young women, which it did. Now this was no longer a doll. This was a child. They would take it for rides. They'd talk to it. Mm -hmm. They'd buy clothing for it, jewelry. They treated it just as though it was that little girl who was killed, Annabelle. Now they were giving it a lot of recognition. Soon after the first seance, things would happen in their house, what we refer to as infestation. There'd be knocking sounds. They'd see flashing lights in their bedroom at night shooting across the room. The bed would shake a little bit. It would get icy cold. They'd hear whispering, which we call magic whispering. Now, from time to time, these girls would change shifts. But they were getting a little scared now. So they decided to stay on the same shift all the time, mm -hmm. 4 to 12. They'd leave the doll in the bedroom. They'd come home after midnight, put the key in the door, unlock the door, and who do you think is standing there? The Raggedy Ann doll. Standing there. Now, that doll has flimsy legs. Mm -hmm. You try to stand it up, you can't. But I've seen that doll stand. I've seen a lot of things happen around that doll. Well, this still didn't scare them. But one of the fiancés, or one of the girls, was against all of this. He said, burn the doll, throw it away, get rid of it, it's evil. Well, he falls asleep one afternoon, a Saturday, and uh, the doll is in a chair not far from him, and the girls are cleaning up the apartment. Mm -hmm. He wakes up with a start, he said, my God, what a nightmare. He said, uh, I dreamt that that doll was strangling me. He had marks on his throat. Was it psychosomatic? Well, let's see. He gets up, he looks at the doll in the chair, picks it up and throws it right across the room. You're nothing but a rag doll. You couldn't hurt anyone. With that, Tony, seven psychic slashes appear on his body. Wow. Now, we've seen these kind of slashes. We've filmed them. These slashes come from nowhere. The blood came right through his shirt. The nurses witnessed this. Then, 
A huge chair rolled across the room. Pictures on the walls came off, started smashing and breaking. Loud pounding sounds. Now they were all frightened. They called the High Episcopal Canon in Hartford, Connecticut. He called Father Richard Nolan, an exorcist, and Father Nolan called us. We went to the apartment. Exorcism was performed immediately over the people, the three people, and the apartment. I brought that doll back to my museum. Now, why would I have something like that in a museum? Evidence, proof. The skeptics, the atheists, mm -hmm. the first thing they attack you with is, where is the evidence? Where is the proof? This never happened. I not only have the doll, I have film, I have recordings, I have eyewitness accounts from credible people who have seen these phenomena happen in and around that doll. A priest comes to my home one day. Young fella, has his rectory right here in uh, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Ed, I'd like to take you and Lorraine for a ride in my new car. Very proud of it. We went with him. When he took us back, he said, what about this doll everybody's talking about? Because we've shown it on Channel 18, on a TV show we're on. Could I see it? I understand it put slashes on people. I brought him into the museum. It's in a chair. Mm -hmm. He looks at it. Just like the guy in Hartford. He walks right over to it, never said a word. Picked it up and threw it right across the room. God is more powerful than a devil. I said, yes, Father. God is more powerful than millions of devils. But he wasn't. He found that out. Less than an hour later, driving home on Route 84, his brand new car went out of control. I know what he's talking about because the same thing happened to Rain and I when we talked about Amityville one time on Route 84. Hmm. You can't control the car. Half of his car was sheared off by a tractor trailer truck. He should have been killed, but he lived. God will only let the devil go so far. The last thing he remembers seeing was the image of that doll. Well, then a detective comes to our house. We're working on the murder of a little child. The rain often helps the police through a clairvoyance. I threw my knowledge of ritual magic murders. After we threw, he said, Ed, can I go out to the museum there and look around? Sure, I brought him out. Now, this is a homicide detective. You were a cop. These guys are tough guys. They're used to seeing grazing sites, right? Mm -hmm. He looks around and he said, you know, of all the things in this building here, that doll there, I can't take my eyes off of it. For agony in. It was still in the chair. Just then, the phone rang. It was a personal call. I told him I'd be right back, not to touch anything in that building. Mm -hmm. Everything in there was unholy, unblessed. Right. Well, I'm up there talking on the phone. I wasn't even there 10 minutes. When all of a sudden, I hear him coming up the stairs. This guy is a big guy, six foot two, six foot three, over 200 pounds, all muscle, used to seeing grizzly sights. He's shaking. I was going to call an ambulance. There was no 911 then. Call an ambulance. Said no, Ed. It's not that. I said, what's wrong? I just don't want to talk about it. He was embarrassed. Lorraine walked in. He looks at Lorraine. He said, I'll talk to Lorraine about it, but I don't want her to ever mention it again. She didn't have to. I knew what he did. I went back down into the building. Everything was knocked over. He had picked up the doll. He had picked up that inanimate object. Its aura mingled with his aura. And something so terrible occurred to that man that he resigned from the police department <laughs> three months later. But that's not the end. We had a group <laughs> it's almost the end of the show. We're almost out of time. So out of time. If you could well, quickly end that one. A group of college students came one day. One of them said there's nothing but a uh, bunch of bunk. I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. He went over to the Raggedy Ann doll, which is in case, knocking on it. He said, uh, this doll can't do anything. I dare it right now to put slashes on me. I put him out of the building. Less than three hours later, that boy was dead. His girlfriend, who had been with him on a motorcycle, said he was laughing about the doll, smashed into a tree, head on, was killed instantly. His girlfriend was in a hospital for over a year. That's unbelievable. We don't challenge devils. I think we got a picture of the That's Raggedy Ann there. Yeah, I think we do mm -hmm. somewhere here. The Lorraines simply took the doll to their home, which is now a museum, and locked it up in a box made of wood and glass forever. Now let's talk about the Smurl haunting. The Smurl family moved into what seemed like a cozy home in 1986 on Chase Street, West Pittston. Their first few days went great until they saw that some kind of force threw the family's dog across the room the girls even got attacked at night by some paranormal force, and the grandmother got a heart attack after she saw a black cloud in the house with a malevolent force. The family just couldn't believe what was going on, and the fear kept increasing through the days. A strange, putrid smell emerged inside the house, which could not be explained. This caught the attention of the Warrens. Lorraine spent extensive time sitting with the children and touring the house to try to connect with whatever was inhabiting the home. She identified a demon or poltergeist-like entity that was using the spirits of a harmless old lady. 
a violent girl, and a man who died in a car accident to corrupt the family. Ed tried his best to use religious provocations against the demon. The news of the incidents occurring in this duplex house spread throughout the neighborhood and in the local media. The Catholic Church sent a priest to spend some time in their home for obvious reasons. The priest left after a few days as nothing demonic was happening. Now let's hear about this incident from Ed and Lorraine themselves. On you know, the swirls, is that what most people do? Yeah, the mm -hmm. swirls were um, the all-American family, really. You know, they were civic-minded. Uh, they had the, in fact, Jackson Merle had started the first girls basketball team in West Piston. Uh, they were all around American family. So people would say, well, what did they do to open up the doors? They didn't do anything. Mm -mm. They are what we call the chosen ones. When I say chosen ones, this family here, very religiously oriented, good Catholics, good Christians, were picked for one purpose. God wanted to show his power over evil, and these were the people he did it through. Mm -hmm. It says here, in one particularly horrifying event, Janet recalls being downstairs in the basement doing laundry when she heard a faint voice call out her name. She looked out the basement over, she looked the basement over quickly, and the source of the voice, but she couldn't find anything. Again, she heard her name, Janet. Her fear heightened as she spun around. She knew no one was home, yet she had a distinct feeling that she was not alone. When the voice called a third time, Janet responded, what do you want? The voice did not answer, but continued to call her name. Now, what's that? You know how many people hear voices like this in their homes? They hear the wife pull up in a car, open the door, come in, set the groceries down. The husband will yell up, uh, you're home, honey? He goes up, there's nobody there. These sounds come through telepathy. They're telepathically projected to the listener. Now, this is what she was hearing. Now, you also notice, Tony, now they're beginning to show fear. Yeah, because it says here that she immediately located her rosary beads and began praying. Yes. And it says, in another incident, while folding clothes one afternoon, Janet felt a sudden chill enter the room. Mm -hmm. She glanced up and watched as a dark figure, human in form, glided past her and made its way to the living room. With a paralyzed fear, she just stood and stared. Yeah. After a few moments, she mustered the strength to follow the path of the dark visitor into the living room, which she found to be empty. Shaken, she decided to visit Jack's mother, Mary, who lived in the other half of the duplex. Upon entering the other half, Janet noticed that Mary was visibly upset. She sat upright in a rocking chair, gripping the arms of the chair. Before Janet could explain the strange event that had just occurred, Mary explained that a dark figure had just come through the wall and passed through the house. Shadow ghost. Uh, shadow ghosts are the most dangerous. They can actually solidify to the extent that they're almost like cement. And of course, Tony, they could walk right through the walls. Oh, no Doesn't problem. mean anything whatsoever. But now both women are frightened, so now they're feeding it says there were also incidents that occurred in, few, in full view of more than one family member. An exceptionally disturbing event occurred one night in the summer of 85. Mm -hmm. While lying in bed, curled up in Jack's arms, Janet suddenly felt a force grab her leg and begin to pull her from the bed. Jack recalls it was like a tug of war going on. Mm -hmm. I was holding on to her as hard as I could because I had no idea what the thing wanted to do to her. But the harder I tried to keep her next to me, the harder it pulled on her. Eventually, the force subsided on its own. That same night, both Jack and Janet were subjected to horrible pounding, mysteriously coming from the inside of their wall, and a stench so horrible filled the room, and they were forced to leave. Now, what do you think the, was happening the, there? Now, well, what happens here is that solidif uh, solidification takes place around Janet's leg, almost as though something was grabbing her, and pulls her out of the bed. Fortunately, Jack was holding on to her. But most of the time, the husband can't even hold on to the wife. She's just pulled right out. Uh, these are, the, again, all the beginning stages of infestation. Much worse things are going to take place in this family. The levitations, the smells, the odor that they smelled. Yeah, that's the demonic. Yes. The, uh, hum inhuman spirits, devils or demons, hate human beings. They were created by God. They go into the dark areas during the uh, light hours of the day. Where do they go? They go into the graves, into these old ancient graves. They love to see a body deteriorating. This was God's creation. That's why when people say, Oh, this thing entered the room and I could smell this foul thing like garbage or something dead. That's because this thing has been in the grave somewhere. Oh, boy. <laughs> no family member was exempt, it says. The children mm -hmm. complained of people floating around their beds at night and intense fluttering sounds as if a large winged beast were in the room. On, one, on more than one occasion, the younger children, Karen and Sharon, Shannon, were tossed from their beds, thrown across the room like rag dolls. Jack would run to the screaming children, finding them in a heap on the floor, bruised and frightened. And it says even the family dog, Simon, yes. was subjected to the phenomenon, coming to the aid of Janet, who was being choked by an invisible force. And then it just says the dog was, and it says a question mark. The incidents could no longer be ignored. Although they had talked about it before, 
Jack and Janet now giving serious consideration to the idea that their problem was beyond that of logic and reason. What they were experiencing was something unnatural. Events were getting worse, near to the point of fearing for their lives and the lives of their family. They decided it was time to actively seek outside help. During her days, Janet spent researching the paranormal, and although she learned that her family was not only one to experience these types of phenomena, the books offered no real explanation as to why these events were occurring, mm -hmm. or how to make them stop, how to make them stop. That's true. Their reading provided nothing more than the documentation of events or fantastical fiction about demons in the demonic underworld. Mm -hmm. It seemed as if no one really knew what was happening. The Smurls were finally given a break in their exhaustive search for help when in 1986 a professor from the local college gave them the name of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Do you no. know those two people? <laughs> now tell me, this is, this is kind of strange. That professor at that college, we helped his mother. Did you really? And an apartment in New York. And yeah. one time coming back from the Smurls' home, uh, we were hit almost hit head on. And uh, I swerved the car, we and the Henry Hudson uh, Parkway. The other car hit the back of my car, knocked it out of control, and right up on, onto the grass. And naturally, we were out, out of commission. So mm -hmm. the police came along, and they took Lorraine to a telephone. And where'd they take her? Right where this professor had lived, and where she had, really? had phone, right where he lived. Tony, in New York City? In New York City. New York City, like the biggest city in the world almost. Yeah. Tony, this is the first case after Ed's heart attack in 85. So Ed, you had your heart attack in 85, and the first case you went out was, was the this first one? case, right, after that. It says here that once you arrived, it didn't take long to determine the nature of the problem. In short, the Warrens found what was a story told to be the family parallel that of a typical demonic attack case. The phenomenon purportedly displayed in the household, coupled with the sincerity of this upstanding family, was enough for the Warrens to consider this valid in a serious case. Psychic evaluations conducted, conducted by Lorraine have revealed that there were indeed several entities involved in the Smurl case. Four entities had been identified, mm -hmm. three human spirits and one demonic. Mm -hmm. Although the three human spirits were of no less concern to the Warrens, they knew that what they were really up against was a demon, an entity that was never human to begin with. Tell me about no. that. Okay, now this is the first day in the house. And Ed had brought, you know the box, Tony, that he has that has all the first-class relics in it? Right. All of those first-class relics have been given to us. We never actually sought any of them out. And we have all the papers from Rome concerning them. Ed took them up, and he put them on the bed in the master bedroom. And he and I sat on the bed, and he put on this music, this um, chanting, chanting music. Gregorian chanting. Gregorian chanting music. And he had it on real low, and we this were saying... This is provoking what's in that house. Evil spirits hate Gregorian chanting. They hate prayers. And we they were, hate the name of Jesus or God. And we were praying. We, we were saying prayers out loud together. And with this, Tony, there were louver doors on the um, closet. But the carpet was so thick, and they never had the doors playing down. So you had to, like, pick the doors up, you know, to open them or close them. And going back and forth like crazy, the doors were. Mm -hmm. Then the television lit up but it wasn't plugged in. Then all the things about this in there. Then all the things that were on the bureau began to dance all around. That infestation phase becomes the gateway to phase two, oppression. Right. It says the purpose mm -hmm. of the oppression stage is to weaken the body and mind, and more simply, to destroy the human will so it can no longer fight back. Well, when they're talking about mm -hmm. oppression, what they're talking about here is it's similar to having a, an invisible being alongside of you, whispering negative thoughts, discouraging thoughts, frightening thoughts into your mind. That's where the oppression it's, comes It's in. going to have people plot against each other within that Christian Anger, family. fights. Mm -hmm. It says it was during this stage that the devil begins to reveal his true self. Then it says here the activity suddenly stopped. Jack, having seen the ability the Warrens had to start and stop the demonic activity, felt washed over with a wave of relief. Mm -hmm. The next step for the Warrens was an obvious one, now having proven to them that this was indeed a case, a true case of demonic infestation. They suggested to the Smurls that they contact a priest at their church and have an exorcism performed in the house. Uh -huh. Janet contacted the church as the Warrens instructed. The Smurls began a religious, being a religious family and an active, active in church, were hopeful that an exorcism would rid their family of the demon. The response they got from the church, however, was not the one they expected. Nope. Both Janet and Smurl and the Lorraine and Lorraine tried on several occasions to get a priest from the local Roman Catholic Church to visit the house. Mm -hmm. Every attempt was unsuccessful. What oh, happened, yeah. right? One time, one time after traveling all the way down there to meet with this priest and talk to him, he told me he didn't have time for me that day because there was a couple coming that. Uh, that was he, the chancellor we were talking about. No, no. This is the parish priest first time uh, that he didn't have time to talk with me because of the fact that he had to instruct a couple that were going to be getting married. says, so without even taking the time to say so, the church had made it very clear 
that they wanted nothing to do with a case of demonic attack and no intention mm -hmm. of performing an exorcism. No, they didn't. In the 13 prior years, <clears throat> the Smurls had experienced every possible terror as part of the demonic attack, including the physical destruction of their home, mysterious bite marks appearing on their bodies, strange shadow creatures roaming their house, mm -hmm. being thrown across rooms by invisible hands. As horrible as those events were, they seemed to pale in comparison to the realization that their own church had turned its back on them. And they didn't lose faith. Now, that's amazing that they didn't. They did not lose their faith, Tony. Not once did they lose their faith. Because it says here their entire lives had focused around the church. It, it well, did. The Smurls it passed did. the values of the church down to their children as they had been passed to them through parents. They attended Mass every week and had remained heavily involved in church activities. Mm -hmm. Their faith in the Smurl family was remarkably strong. It was. And now, when they needed its help the most, the church had denied them. Mm -hmm. It was painful, angering, and frustrating all at the same time. The news came as equal surprise to the Warrens, whose faith in the Roman Catholic Church is of particular relevance to their livelihood and spiritual well-being. And Lorraine told the, war, uh, the, Smur the Smurls to remain faithful. Mm -hmm. They would contact a friend of theirs in the church, whom they had worked on, with on several occasions. He would help. Right. Meanwhile, the Warrens arranged for an exorcism from another priest, and the Smurl house was fervent with demonic activity at that point. It was as if they were being punished by the demon for seeking help. Mm -hmm. Activity heightened in both frequency and intensity. In what was likely the most terrifying experience in his life, Jack recalls the night he was physically and sexually attacked by a succubus. But this was tell a me what that succubus is? Yes, a succubus is a, a demon who attacks the male physically and sexually. The incubus attacks the female physically and sexually. These are the most horrendous mm -hmm. types of attacks, as you'll hear Jack's <clears throat> description of it now. It says here, the following quotes were extracted from a taped interview with Jack Smurl, and this is what Jack says. To be honest, I even hate to think about her. Her skin was paper white but it was covered in some places with the scaly surface I mentioned, and then at other places with open sores, the kind you'd think a leper would have or something. And these sores were running with pus. She had long, white, scraggly hair, and her eyes were all red, and the inside of her mouth and her gums were green. Awful. Jack is calling it a, a she here. It's an it. It's not a she, it's not a, it's not a he. It's something that has never walked this earth. It's something horrible, ugly, filthy to it. But if you ever met Jack... Oh, he, and, he didn't want to even describe this oh, or talk about it. And if it. you ever met the no. type of man he was to have that happen to him. In fact, when he would go on a couple of national shows, uh, these uh, talk hosts uh, thought it was a big joke and they'd start joking about it. He was humiliated, of course. Oh, he didn't terrible. want to talk about this at all. He said, I don't want to talk about the succubus attacks. This is Jack contacted Ed Warren in the morning and explained the previous night's events. With growing concern, the Warrens brought in Father Robert McKenna. Mm -hmm. As a traditional Roman Catholic priest from Connecticut, Father McKenna had been involved with the Warrens for many years and performed countless exorcisms. Mm -hmm. The Warrens now asked their friend to help the Smurl family in expelling the demon from their lives. The arrangements were made and Father McKenna arrived at the Smurl home in Pennsylvania. After a brief conversation with the family he, that he donned his vestments and began the formal rite of exorcism, Father McKenna moved from room to room, mm -hmm. sprinkling holy water and reciting holy words in Latin. He carried with him a crucifix, a large rosary, and a relic of a saint. After he completed the inside of the house, he moved to the outside, where he performed the same rites on the plot of land surrounding the house. Mm -hmm. Once the exorcism was complete, the Smurls thanked Father Robert Kenna and he packed up and returned back to Connecticut. Although the exorcism had proven temporary relief from the demonic attacks, it did not rid the Smurls of the problem completely. The Warrens kept a close watch over the Smurls and soon were hearing reports from the family that activity had once again resumed. Mm -hmm. Levitating objects, the return of the fetid odor, and wrappings on the wall marked the return of the demon. <clears throat> the family was crushed. Both the Warrens and Father McKenna had warned them that an exorcism is not always successful, but the Smurls so hoped that this would be the end of the problem. Right. Again, Father McKenna was brought to the house for a second attempt. As in the first exorcism, he blessed each room, repeated the exorcism prayers in Latin. At the end of the exorcism, he added a special prayer for the Smurls that the Lord might grant them peace from the demon and allow them to move on. Mm -hmm. The Smurls were again at peace. Over the next few days and then weeks, the family began piecing their lives back together. They had endured a demonic barrage for 13 long years and had come out on the other side intact and stronger in faith. But like the last exorcism, the peace didn't last. The hold the demon had on the Smurl family was one of the strongest the Warrens have ever encountered. Mm -hmm. So those two exorcisms, two were exorcisms not successful. didn't do it. No, they did not, Tony. No, I, and I no. think the reason that it didn't do is because God wasn't yet ready to show his power. His power was to come, and in a great way. Oh, yes. All right, so here at the end, this is going public, this, this last little prayer here. Yes, says, it is. It was becoming too much for the Smurls to handle. After more than a decade of torture and no assistance from the church, the family was exhausted and didn't know how much more they could endure. After much contemplation between Jack and Janet, they decided it was time to take their story public. Mm -hmm. 
The Smurl family made several appearances on a talk show, had a local newspaper write an article, and they had their story told in a book in collaboration with the Warrens. That's the book, The Haunted. Right. Their hope was that someone who could end their problem once and for all would hear their story. They had also hoped that the church, which was still providing no assistance in the matter, would be, for the lack of a more appropriate term, shamed into helping. And they were so shamed into it. Well, Tony, one man, one man that we never even knew, who was in Rome, who studied to be a Roman Catholic priest, who left just before ordination, uh -huh. but had made many contacts in Rome during that period of time. He left because of health reasons within his family. He has a huge Catholic bookstore in New York City. He read the book. He was appalled by what he read. He wrote a letter and sent the book to Cardinal Ratzinger at the Vatican. We got a copy of that in the mail. We went down to the Smurl home. The very night that we got that, we were going down there for dinner with them. And now they had moved to Wilkes-Barre. So we kind of laughed about it. Can't imagine. Right. Nobody else is helping. Why, why is Rome Why, why would Rome listen to this man? Yeah. Sending Who is a letter. This man? But God works in strange ways. So Cardinal Ratzinger took the uh, bull by the horns, got an exorcist. They sent him right there to uh, the Smurl way. home. It was done and here's the, here's the kicker. The very priest that didn't want to help them in the beginning, <laughs> told them they could, he didn't want to be bothered. There's a knock on the door. Mrs. Smurl opens up the door. Here's the priest. He's got a box of candy in his hands. Well, Mrs. Smurl, how are you? Well, nice. I've got Even some the bishop came. good news for you. And they don't understand why this guy's there because he wasn't going to give them any help. I brought you a little gift, a box of candy, and he said, uh, the good news is that uh, Rome is intervening for you. Uh, Cardinal Ratzinger is having an exorcist sent to your home. That exorcist was sent there. The home was cleared, and the family has lived happily ever since. That was not in the book, The Haunted. No. Because at that time, there was no closing. There was no closing. There, there was, was no, no closure closing on that the time. case. But they're, today, they're doing fine. But the Smurls underwent a second and a third exorcism. They finally had enough of it and decided to move out. 